let's make sure. Yeah. Because there's yours, some. This one. Let's see. Pretty, that's, yeah. my, that's mine. Okay. Technical difficulties. Excuse us one moment. Mine show. Well, I think they're taking a slight break. I mean, we can always use Oops. Twitter to find out. Whoa. <laughs> hmm? Oh, there you go. Oh, there you yeah. go. You know what you did? Needs to. <laughs> <laughs> I clicked something on the left, but I don't know how to make it be up there. Yeah, we need to get uh, somebody who um, is able to do that. Who works at this yeah. metric? What did you do? Just sort of push it? So when they, when they, when they're finished, do you want to click? I would press escape. Um, yeah. So maybe I'll so maybe you're just click. Cool. Yeah. All right, so I think we're going to go ahead and, and get our second panel started here. Um, we just wanted to echo first the thanks to the Duke students who organized this, both for um, giving us a chance to stand back and reflect on the work that we're doing and, and um, learn that way, and also to learn from our colleagues. It's already been a really interesting morning. Um, I'm Jessica Fireman. I'm an attorney at Juvenile Law Center, and this is my colleague Kate Burdick, also an attorney same place, um, and we are happy to be here. Um, we also want to give credit to our co-author, Maura McInerney, who's not here now, but who works at Education Law Center. It's been a great collaboration because she comes in with the background in education law that we lack. Um, so what we want to talk about today is, is creating positive consequences. Um, our, our theory is that as long as we have a juvenile justice system and as long as kids are going into it, um, we really have an obligation to make it work um, for, for the better, to put the kids in a better situation than they were before they went in. Um, we talked a little bit earlier about um, the purpose of the juvenile justice system and its shifting purpose over time. Um, but there's still, and, and what we have up here on the screen is Pennsylvania's um, purpose, or a part of our purpose clause to our Ju Juvenile Justice Act um, it's a fairly representative purpose clause in that um, the issue that Rhea spoke about earlier, that rehabilitation is still um, a part of our act. We now have what's called ba balanced and restorative systems. So it's not the only piece there, but um, every Juvenile Justice Act in the country still has rehabilitation or competency development as a part of its purpose. And so if that's our understanding of what the system is, we need to make it work. Um, I agree with um, everything that's been said earlier that essentially whenever possible we want to divert kids from the system, especially a system that we know is not working as well as it should. Um, and when they're in the system, um, once you're in the juvenile justice system, obviously it doesn't mean you're necessarily going into placement. You could be going, um, staying with your family and having something like functional family therapy, which is um, an evidence-based practice that seems to work better at getting um, youth to a better position than they were before they entered the system, um, as opposed to um, incarceration, which doesn't have such strong evidence bases. Um, but once you're in the, the system, um, what, what we're proposing here is that we should be following very carefully um, how youth are doing, um, connecting them with the services they're entitled to, and focusing on long-term planning and reintegration. And we're going to focus specifically here on education, um, but I think these principles apply to, to other consequences for youth as well. Um, so we're just going to talk about what the systems that we could envision for accomplishing these goals might look like, or at least one suggestion of how we can we do this and um, some of the policy implications. So I'm going to start by giving you a little background. Um, Youth who have been involved with the juvenile justice system are more likely to be absent or truant from school. They are more likely to face disciplinary action in school, to have a disability that qualifies them for special education, um, and ultimately to drop out of school. Just to give you an example, a recent study in Philadelphia showed that 
of youth who had a juvenile justice placement or were involved in the juvenile justice system while in high school, 90% of them ultimately dropped out. Um, so that's shocking and I think it shows that the basically youth who are involved with the juvenile justice system are in, as we always say, in educational crisis. So the reasoning for this poor educational success is kind of twofold. First, many of the factors that are associated with poor educational success, which may include traumatic childhood experiences like abuse and neglect, um, are also associated with involvement in the juvenile justice system. So consequently, many youth enter the juvenile justice system already struggling academically. But um, regrettably, becoming involved in the juvenile justice system usually is the last straw in a series of obstacles that are contributing to a lack of educational success. We know that on-site schools um, are typically of poor quality, certainly not always, but many of them unfortunately are. Also, just transferring in and out of schools comes with a whole host of problems of its own, re-enrollment problems, transferring record problems, um, and just generally being transferred between schools has been shown to alienate youth from the educational process. So in our, argue, uh, in our article, as Jessica mentioned, one of the things that we talk about is that this poor educational outcome could be sort of a lesser known collateral consequence of being involved in the juvenile justice system when really it could be presenting an opportunity for creating positive change and being a positive collateral consequence of involvement in the juvenile justice system. Um, we want to clarify that we are not advocating that youth should be adjudicated for this purpose um, by no means, but again, once a youth becomes involved in the juvenile justice system, which has this at least partially rehabilitative purpose, um, in, there's an opportunity, and we specifically argue that through system and a, a systematized use of education screens, which we'll talk more about, um, that we can improve education outcomes for youth and that this is a time when we can actually make better education outcomes and therefore life outcomes for these kids. So just to, um, to, to jump into what, what we're talking about when we talk about a screen, essentially what we're saying is that um, there are a whole lot of legal entitlements that youth um, should have access to but don't that relate to education. And the youth in the juvenile justice system, because their lives are often tumultuous, end up go flying under the radar and not getting the educational benefits that, to, that they're legally entitled to. Um, so essentially what we're talking about is a checklist. It's a pretty simple concept where you take, um, whether a juvenile probation officer or someone in a facility goes through a set of um, legal entitlements and makes sure that the kid is getting what they are entitled to get. Um, just a little bit of background of how we got into this. Um, obviously we, we have seen in our clients and in the research the educational problems that kids in the juvenile justice system have. We've also been working on it in the, on the child welfare side. And what happened there is we had um, some meetings with um, officials from our State Department of Public Welfare um, to talk about the, uh, the problem. We had a few notable cases of um, young people with severe disabilities going through for maybe 10 or more years in the child welfare system without having their disabilities recognized and without having um, any appropriate education. Um, so we were sitting down to talk about what can we do about this. One of the ideas that was tossed out there was, well, why don't we just have everyone in the child welfare system get an evaluation for special education? We said, well, maybe that's not the greatest idea. We know there's an over-representation problem, too. We know that kids um, in trouble get into the special education system, some often because of behavioral problems and trauma, other issues that need to be addressed, but not because they have special education needs. So somehow we have to figure out a way to identify what the needs are for these, for these youth. Um, what the um, state was already doing for the young children is a screen called Ages and Stages. It's a screen that, um, say, if you have a one-year-old, the caseworker would look and say, Does the, can this child take three steps without holding on to a hand? Does this child say mama or dada? I mean, they're very simple things that a non-expert can figure out to see whether the child is developmentally on track. It became more complicated to figure it out for older youth because um, 
they're more advanced. You don't you know, necessarily know how their calculus is going or not. So what we were trying to do is figure out what are some markers that we could use to identify educational needs of youth that would not um, require educational expertise. So how do we navigate that? That was our challenge. Um, so we, we created a tool. Um, it's probably still an imperfect tool. I'm actually quite sure it is. It's a tool, though, that is now being used in the child welfare system in Pennsylvania. It's being rolled out now for caseworkers to use for every child in the child welfare system. Um, and so we started to get requests. Can we use this on the juvenile justice system? Um, for our youth as well. And we, uh, some of the issues are the same, some of the issues are, are different, so we kind of went back to the drawing board to think about what that would look, look like. But we did find two benefits to the screen um, that are already starting to emerge on the child welfare side. Obviously, we were looking for that individual level assistance. How can we connect kids with the um, services to which they're eligible? But we also realized uh, over time that it would create a good um, system for collecting data um, that if caseworkers across the state are using this same tool and following a set of um, elements and finding out whether kids are receiving those services, um, we can start to find out which services youth are receiving, um, which services maybe are helping them if we can c c compare that data with their educational outcomes. So it's um, become also a tool for, for gathering information that will hopefully inform our policy work. A couple of reasons that we wanted to use a, this checklist tool, I mean, obviously it's, it's um, just a way of, of, of guiding practice in a, in a world where the law is complex and where we can't expect every um, individual in the system to know the whole realm of education law. It also allows multiple stakeholders to contribute to its development. So we were able to work with doctors at the Children's Hospital of Pennsylvania to say, are we, are we tr looking for the right triggers for when a child maybe needs a special education evaluation? Does this look right to you? Um, it, as I mentioned earlier, it allows us to collect uniform data. Um, a downside um, to checklists or using this kind of approach is that um, we can imp impede creativity. One of the things that, that we want people in the system to be doing is relating very directly to the individual needs of the, of the youth they're working with and not just going through a set of check boxes. So as we create it, we're trying to keep that in mind and keep some open-ended questions and areas where we're encouraging folks to um, um, think about the individual needs of the, of the youth in front of them. So we don't have youth in front of them. So we don't have time to go through every single educational right or entitlement or service um, that could be identified and connected to a kid through a screen, especially because it might be different or it's definitely going to be different jurisdiction to jurisdiction, but we wanted to give you a little bit better idea of the types of things that could be covered by a screen. So the first is pre-placement considerations. Um, one of the things that we know is that education is often not on the forefront of people's minds when thinking about the appropriate disposition or placement for a youth involved in the juvenile justice system. So our hope is that by administering the screen or part of the screen even before the child is in potentially an institution that we can help make sure that that placement or whatever the disposition is is going to be educationally appropriate and suit the kids needs as best as possible um, and also if done right a pre-placement use of a screen could help to make sure that it, or direct kids towards non-secure or evidence-based placements um, we also want to make sure that just general education needs are addressed through a screen um, both to make sure that kids are receiving any remedial services or other general education services, tutoring, et cetera, for which they're eligible, making sure they are on track towards graduation or whatever GED program or other educational goal they have. And again, as I mentioned, the problems that come with transferring schools, um, that could be addressed by a screen, making sure that there's no delay in re-enrollment, that there's no delay in transferring records, uh, and that credits are being transferred properly. 
Special education is a big one. As we mentioned before, you know, it's as many as 70% of kids in the JJ system have a disability that qualifies them for special education services. And we also know that many of them are not getting appropriate special education services while they are involved in the system. Um, a lot of these kids also are specifically diagnosed with emotional disturbance, and we know that kids who have emotional disturbance are having particularly bad outcomes. The research shows that. Um, so it's important to have a screen that connects kids to the services for which they're eligible under either the IDEA or state educa special education law. The IDEA in particular has a very extensive um, and detailed procedural and substantive requirements aimed at ensuring that children with disabilities um, receive the individualized education services. And so, for example, under the IDEA, um, you know, kids who have spe bleh, eligible disabilities are entitled to have an individualized education plan. So a screen can help make sure that youth who are, need to be evaluated are, and that they have an appropriate and timely updated IEP, um, and that they have an education decision maker, and that special education transition planning happens. Um, as Jessica mentioned, there's also an overrepresentation problem. We're going to talk a little bit more about how that would work in a screen in a little bit. Um, in addition to IDEA and other special education accommodations. There are other federal laws, um, specifically Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act and also the Americans with Disabilities Act um, that provide additional support for youth who may have certain disabilities. Um, this works slightly differently than special education, but for example, um, a kid who has diabetes might not be eligible for special education, but still could have a Section 504 plan that makes sure that the shots that they need don't interfere with their learning. And finally, reintegration services um, are very important, and this section of the screen would be designed to establish a clear plan for how they're going to be entering back into the community, making sure that they've gotten credit for work that they've done, that the re-enrollment process is um, you know, happening in a timely way and in the appropriate school. A lot of times, home schools are reluctant, reluctant to re-enroll youth who've been in a juvenile justice placement. Um, so it's important that whoever is administering the screen, which would probably be a probation officer or someone in the institution, is thinking about these things as the youth is preparing to discharge from the system. And now Jessica is going to talk more about how a screen would work in practice. So what we have in this slide, which turned out very orange, <laughs> is um, just an example of one phase of the um, one one question from the screen that we used on the child welfare side, but one which would be largely applicable on the juvenile justice side too. Um, and um, it's maybe the most challenging one um, because uh, this is where we're struggling with overrepresentation versus underrepresentation. In that we want to make sure that youth who need special education services um, get evaluations and find them, but we really don't want to be pushing youth who don't need them into the system. And so our our first box there, I think, in some ways, was an easier one. We're saying if you already have a diagnosis. And the, here are the ways that, um, in this case, a caseworker might know that you have a diagnosis because you're placed somewhere where kids with diagnoses go, for example, or because you have it in your medical record. Then that, and, and it's connected to your capacity to learn. Then that's, that seems like an easier one where those kids really might need um, special education. The second one is the one where I, uh, I think we really would like to do some validation studies to try to figure out if we've got it right. I'm not sure that we do, but we, um, we really wanted to avoid the kids who were in the system for 10 years without getting the services. This is why we've created it. But basically, if you're struggling um, a lot academically and other things are happening, you're, um, thank you, you're, um, you're, so you're struggling very much academically. We tried to, to make it clear this is not just a few problems here and there. Um, if you have a history of special education services, that's also maybe an easier trigger. Um, and um, we were looking for a pattern so that it's not just something that happened once. The problem is 
Um, kids in the system, um, often in either child welfare or juvenile justice system, um, re more and more research is going out to link that the problems that they're having with the trauma they're experiencing rather than a, a real learning disability. And there's some great research on trauma-informed education so that you keep a kid in regular education, um, but you address the, the, the needs that they're having because of PTSD, that they're having a flashback and that that's affecting their learning. So, um, so we're, we're hoping that we'll be able to um, do some studies on this um, portion of the screen to try to figure out, are we catching the right kids? Um, then, and uh, letter C, the same thing. It's, it's, you know, you have serious disciplinary problems and you're also not going to school, um, uh, truancy problems or, or discipline problems. Again, it's the same, it's the same problems that we're, we're struggling with. This is um, one iteration and we're hoping to sort of get feedback, do studies, and figure out how well it works. Um, students, family, or caregiver believes the student should be evaluated. That's, that's an easier one, and that's usually how the system works. And the reason we're doing this for youth in the juvenile justice system is a lot of them are um, you know, not, not necessarily living with their families. Um, the family is not, should always be engaged, but is not always um, being given the information. So if other people can participate in finding out what's going on educationally with youth, that will help. So um, speaking of the family, I mean, in the, in the system for getting special education, so what happens if you, if, you know, somebody, j juvenile probation officer checks a box, yes, the youth needs services. Um, the tool then leads them through what are the steps that you need to take. Um, it, in, in this case, um, the first step is always to, uh, to get an evaluation for a youth is to engage the family. It's the family that needs to make the request. So hopefully this serves as a, um, also as a, um, a prevention device for over-including youth and in that the fa family can say, my, my kid doesn't need these services. The family has now been engaged in the process. Here's what's going on with your kid's school. We think there might be a problem. Um, if, if the family says, no, I don't want my child evaluated, the law is set up so that that's their right, they can say that. Um, then the tool goes on to, you know, if you can't locate a parent, this happens a lot for youth who are duly adjudicated, they're in the um, child welfare and juvenile justice system, who's in charge of making these decisions on behalf of the kids? And those are the kids that especially get sort of fall through the cracks on, on these issues. So then there's a whole complex area of law we don't want people to have to memorize, but um, this tool should guide them. Here's how you figure out who to talk to to try to get the kid the services they need. Um, and then we've tried to leave an open, an, a sort of a more open box, another action to meet the child or youth's needs. And again, this is supposed to be a clause to get you to be able to say, wait, actually, this child needs counseling, not special education. There are some other services that might be appropriate here. So that's just to sort of give you a sense of, of how the, scr the screen might look um, practically. Um, so I want to just talk a little bit now about Title I, Part D, which is um, one part of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. So that's our big education law. Some people call it No Child Left Behind. Um, the, the purpose of Title I, Part D is to improve educational services for um, youth in the juvenile justice system, essentially, and those who may enter the juvenile justice system, um, to provide them with transition services to education or employment, and um, to engage in dropout prevention for these youth and youth at risk of being in this situation. Um, I'm just gonna talk about one part of the act just to use it as an example of some of its strengths and weaknesses. Um, and I'm talking about it because I think that it, um, the, the, the information that we gather on screens can be used to um, improve what, how Title I uh, Part D is currently structured, um, and also that it can be supported by Title I Part D. So um, the, the piece of it I want to talk about is the, um, is the state agency programs. The, the, the Act gives funding for state agencies to engage in this work and also for local um, education agencies to do so. Um, so um, the Act is very flexible. That's both its, its strength and its weakness. It provides some guidance about good practices, um, but its clause for use of funds is very broad. So the, the requirements that are placed on a state that receives these funds is, come out in the state plan portion of the Act. 
um, the state must establish performance measures. So they have to assess how they're doing on behalf of these youth. Um, and they, uh, to the extent feasible, they have to give youth the same opportunities to achieve as in local schools. I'm not sure exactly what the extent feasible means. I would like to just strike that clause, but it's there for now. Um, so this, a little bit more detail comes out in the state application portion of the act, which um, says wh when you as a state apply here, the things you have to include in your application, um, it mentions coordination with other programs and local school districts. You have to talk about the kind of professional development you're going to do so that teachers can meet the needs of the, the youth. Um, you have to designate someone in charge of transitions back to school for youth who are re-entering, coordinate with businesses for mentoring, assure assistance in locating alternative education for youth who are not going back to their, um, to their regular local school, work with parents, address disabilities issues, and work on re-entry for youth who have dropped out. Um, but as you see here, this is the, um, this is the um, use of funds clause, and it's really very broad. Concentrate on providing participants with the knowledge and skills needed to make a successful transition to secondary school completion, vocational, or technical training for their education or employment. So you can use these funds for almost anything some states are using them to pay for math teachers. Other states have used them to make very um, careful and thoughtful reintegration programs for youth. Other states have used them for publications that talk about education rights for youth. So, so they're really being used very widely. Um, so what role could a screen play in addressing how Title I Part D works um, and, and also in using Title I Part D? So the language in Title I Part D requires um, performance measures to see how it's working. Um, and, and that means that facilities and states are conducting something to figure out how kids are doing educationally. Um, most of them are doing um, some form of math and reading test. And they'll do that when a child enters um, a facility and again when the child um, leaves the facility. And that is a good place to start. If you're in a facility, you at least want to know that um, math and reading levels are going up. Um, what we're suggesting here is that that is a starting point. If you could connect it with also requiring states to collect information on you know, the array of, of items that we've listed earlier that Kate just described, you could get a lot more and a lot richer data about how youth are doing and what their needs are. Um, the, also, the assessments currently used are just assessments. They're not tied to action plans. So a screen can um, give more guidance to, um, to the staff members about exactly what to do. Um, but because this is a part of federal law that's up for reauthorization, if we could get, if we could first of all embed some of the requirements that we gather more data on youth into um, Title I Part D now, we could start to um, get a better sense of what youth what youth's needs are, and, and perhaps we would end up with this broad type of use of funds clause, but perhaps we would identify some things like youth maybe um, the, the funding should be focused on um, prevention, on reintegration, on community-based placements. If we can see that youth are doing better educationally when they're um, staying in their home, remaining in their same school, um, receiving um, family-based therapy at home, um, if that type of information could be gathered as part of the assessment in Title I Part D, we could link their educational success to um, policies that work better for them all around. I think we're over our time, so, so we will stop. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Everybody should stand up for a minute and stretch. I'm going to put my PowerPoint on. I'm trying to do it for you here. Great. Hi, everybody. My name is uh, Dean Rifkin from the University of Tennessee College of Law. I want to thank the um, editors of the forum for giving me the opportunity to present my paper and to um, tell you a little bit about the practice uh, challenges and lessons that uh, have come from a course that we've been teaching for the last year and a half, uh, a course called 
public interest lawyering, um, education law practicum, in which we have uh, dedicated our work to uh, defense of students in truancy prosecutions and more broadly trying to reform uh, the system in our uh, community, which as a result of the work that I did on my paper uh, is quite clear that um, our community is, is not uh, terribly atypical um, in how uh, it criminalizes or attempts to criminalize uh, students who are truant. Um, my paper is, uh, the title of my paper is Truancy Prosecutions of Students and the Right, I always say bracket, uh, to uh, education. What I want to do is give you um, a brief context uh, in terms of why I, I wrote the paper and why we're doing this course. Um, and then tell you a bit about the paper, uh, and then work on uh, recounting to you some of the work we've been doing in uh, our practicum. Um, this is a quote um, from uh, David Bazelon, who is the late, probably late, late um, chief judge of the um, United States Court of Appeals for the District uh, of Columbia, um, and uh, a very strong advocate of, uh, of mental health uh, uh, issues uh, while he was alive. Um, and it's no coincidence that uh, there is a Bazelon Center for Mental Health Law based in DC. Um, this quote captured for me much of what um, we've been seeing and uh, researching uh, about truancy. Um, and the, the quote led me to um, write this paper and to engage in the kind of practice that we're engaging in. So let me give you a little context. Um, for about 20 years, uh, a pitifully small band of lawyers, um, legal services, private practitioners, solo, uh, special ed lawyers have been engaged in a campaign, and it's probably uh, uh, a little bit over, an overstatement to say it, it's an organized campaign, but it's been a series of litigation dealing with issues of school uh, exclusion. Um, uh, it started uh, with uh, a case in the 1990s called the Chris L case which was a case uh, involving a student who scratched a desk, or no, actually, he, he kicked a pipe um, at school. It broke, um, he was prosecuted, and uh, the case actually went from uh, IDEA due process all the way up to a cert petition, which we prevailed all the way, um, saying uh, essentially that the school couldn't uh, file this petition um, without, uh, without complying with the provisions of the IDEA. Um, this was, I, I guess you could say, a private enforcement case. Um, and I actually wrote about it last year uh, in an article in the New York uh, Law Review called Decriminalizing Students with Disabilities. There's a big story there. Um, other work that we did over the years, though, that led to the, the truancy work we're doing, um, some of it was just pure enforcement work, an OCR complaint on behalf of uh, students who um, uh, I should say youth who were transferred to be tried as adults and who were not receiving special education uh, in the facility where they were held pre-trial. Um, we brought uh, a class action case s uh, establishing the right to alternative education on behalf of students who were expelled for zero tolerance offenses. And we followed that up with a class action case similar to the case that Jane did here in North Carolina uh, on behalf of all kids who were suspended from school, uh, establishing a right to alternative uh, education. Uh, this led us uh, to truancy uh, and truancy prosecutions of, of students. Uh, I have to say that after 40 years of law practice, um, never did I imagine that I would be sort of spending my latter days in truancy court. Um, but that's where uh, I've been, and my colleague Barbara Dyer is here. That's where we've been uh, for the last year and a half. And 
you know, I don't think it's an exaggeration for me to say that if uh, the juvenile court is sort of the archipelago of, uh, you know, the legal system, truancy court is sort of the devil's island of, of, the, uh, of the legal system. Um, it is the uh, least transparent, um, one of the most complex um, systems that uh, I have uh, encountered. And Ria's talk uh, was about sort of the Argo of juvenile uh, practice, and um, we understand that a bit, but the Argo of truancy practice uh, is even more um, involved and complicated, as I think you'll see, uh, I hope you'll see in a minute. Um, truancy is, needless to say, everybody agrees, the, the gateway uh, into the school to prison pipeline. It implicates issues of, of dropout, push out, uh, et cetera. In the course of doing the research for my paper, I came across a terrific uh, 1942 quote um, from uh, uh, an article from 1942 by uh, an educational supervisor who worked in uh, Attica, a prison uh, in New York. And it, it's the first sort of school to prison pipeline quote that I, or article that I, that I was able to find. The name of it was Our Schools Make Criminals. And what he says is, there I saw a little tyke start out along a road which had begun in his school classroom and which probably will end at a prison gate. I know, I know, for after 20 years equally divided between public and prison educational work, I know both ends of that road. Your Honor, a court investigator testified, I know this case well. John's teacher and the principal of his school agree that he is a confirmed truant and troublemaker who refuses to respond to proper influence and treatment. I've read hundreds of juvenile case histories without realizing that a secondhand opinion may become prosecutor and jury for what in effect constitutes a criminal trial. There could be no defense. John was truant and he certainly appeared to be a troublemaker. The judge sealed the fate of the sullen lad. John Doe, on the evidence, this court has no alternative but to declare you a delinquent under the law and commit you to institution named until such time as the authorities are convinced uh, that your attitude and conduct have changed. That's all. Have things changed uh, in the last uh, 50 or, or 60 years? Some, um, but, but not, not that much. As Jane indicated, um, there are, uh, as, of 19, uh, as of 2007, 57,000 reported truancy prosecutions probably more, uh, given the uh, inadequacy of data about, uh, uh, about these cases. Um, I did a truancy, a, a Google truancy alert. I mean, I, a, a Google alert with truancy. It's really great to be researching a topic that has like one word, right? Um, and every day for the last nine months, I've been you know, reading uh, about developments in truancy around the country. And there are many, many developments. One of the things about the truancy uh, system and the prosecution of truancy cases is that it is a remarkable sort of quagmire. It is a, a remarkable system that is pervaded by um, uh, canards and by uh, uh, ossified thinking and by uh, assumptions and by grandstanding uh, by politicians, um, and you know, it's it's not hard. Every day, uh, you see things like uh, you know Mayor Bloomberg's um, initiative last week or two weeks ago in New York, where um, uh, he had Magic Johnson and Trey Songs and other uh, celebrities recording messages, and they're going to send those. They're going to call up kids in the morning, right? And they're going to say, education's important, um, and you need to go to school, right? Uh, apparently in New York, roughly 250,000 students miss school at least once, uh, once a month. Um, uh, initiatives like this uh, exist all, all over the country. Um, uh, there was a story recently about uh, the Nebraska uh, court system, where the Chief Justice of the Nebraska S Supreme Court, the headline is, Justice Warns of Truancy Overload. And uh, in Several other places around the country, lots of other places, you read about the huge number of truancy uh, prosecutions um, that are 
uh, allegedly sort of overburdening, uh, overburdening the court. Um, uh, so when you see, you know, these kind of cartoons, um, they're, 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 they're meant to be sort of funny, but they are really uh, very, um, very painful because the punitive approach to truancy is the approach, uh, the approach that still uh, seems to predominate um, in many parts uh, of, the, uh, of the country. Um, I started out uh, this presentation because, uh, with, with this slide because um, I really do think that uh, truancy um, and the issues that are embedded in it, the many, um, uh, should be considered a civil and human rights issue, which is something that is occurring in uh, the advocacy community, the education advocacy community, uh, around, uh, around the country and uh, I think is uh, a worthwhile sort of rhetorical prism in which to look at some of these uh, issues. Um, some of the cases that have only recently begun to focus on the system of truancy prosecution um, are, are quite horrifying. Um, I'm going to talk more about Boyer in a minute. Uh, the DeLuna case from uh, Texas, which I uh, talk about um, a bit uh, uh, in my uh, paper uh, involves a uh, youth who had uh, terrible um, uh, problems of poverty and, and of course uh, it goes without saying that the system of truancy prosecutions is a system that is um, a system that, that, that focuses, uh, that, that targets kids from low income uh, families, right? Because Kids, uh, families with means are not uh, going to let their kid um, uh, get into this system in, in a variety of ways. Um, but Francisco De Luna in McAllen, Texas had ADHD. He was diagnosed in the third grade. Um, he was cited for not going to school. Texas has this system of, of citations. And I should say that the way truancy is treated around the country is, is, is very different. Some states, um, truancy is a delinquency offense, it's a crime. In other states, uh, such as Tennessee, it's a, an unruly or status offense. Um, but Francisco was, you know, told in the citations that he had a defiant attitude, that he did not want to learn. His behavior at school deteriorated. He was suspended serially. Um, he waived his right uh, and pled guilty to truancy in, 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 in the truancy court, fined. His mother was ordered to pay up to $383 a month uh, in fines for him. Uh, it, he didn't appear, and he ultimately was incarcerated for uh, 18 days. The ACLU has brought litigation over this. Um, Bellevue School District uh, case is, a, is an important case that we're watching, watching from the state of Washington. It's a case uh, in which the right to counsel at initial truancy hearings has been established. Um, many states, I think the, the figure from the Juvenile Law Center amicus brief in uh, Bellevue was something like 32 or 33 states that prosecute uh, uh, students do provide uh, counsel uh, at the initial hearing. Uh, another 15 or 12 or so don't. Uh, I think it, it's going to depend on um, how truancy is, is dealt with. Um, the right to education is what I'm going to talk about uh, in a second in terms of my paper. This is Boyer versus uh, Jeremiah. You can uh, see the Rhode Island case. This is also an ACLU case in which um, you can see the allegations of, of uh, unconstitutional and unlawful uh, treatment of children who are in that court um, for uh, not going to school, right? Um, uh, whoops. Um, how do I get rid of that? Right. Whoops. Go up to next. Yeah. Having an issue here. Um, we need escape on the keyboard. Can I do that? Oh. Whoops. Sorry. That's okay. Um, Just use the arrow to push through. Here we go. Um, this is this is a, a part of the case. Um, 
you can uh, see the allegations here about some of the uh, treatment of the juveniles um, uh, in this family court uh, in Rhode Island. Um, uh, notice uh, fair hearings, uh, uh, inadequate, uh, illegal punishments. Um, I'm going to get to this in a minute. What I want to do is sort of tell you a bit about my paper. Um, after uh, scanning this uh, research and uh, analyzing it and looking at uh, the tangled roots uh, of truancy and the conflicting views of truancy from the uh, agencies that are responsible, um, the child welfare agency, the, uh, prosecu the prosecutors, the um, mental health community, needless to say the schools, the juvenile justice uh, community, um, uh, uh, there, there are different ways that truancy is, is dealt with in different uh, communities. But the approach that seems to predominate is an approach that is a punitive approach and an approach that, um, frankly, um, uh, uh, doesn't hold school systems accountable for uh, issues um, relating to truancy. There are many underlying reasons, as all of you, I'm sure, are aware, um, for uh, children uh, missing school, quote, habitually or, quote, chronically. Um, <clears throat> there are issues around homelessness and transportation and other uh, issues uh, uh, of low-income families. There are mental health and physical issues. There are issues around um, bullying. There are issues around uh, substance abuse, potentially. There are uh, educational issues galore. Uh, students who are, uh, don't have credits uh, uh, and, and become juniors and seniors. Um, uh, issues about suspension and expulsion, bullying, uh, and special education, as you just heard uh, a minute ago. Uh, these are all uh, justified underlying circumstances. Um, my paper develops a, a thesis that uh, looking at the state uh, level uh, constitutionally based uh, adequacy cases um, in which the right to an adequate education has been found in state constitutions and certain state statutory schemes um, and looking at uh, a case, uh, uh, other constitutional cases, Younger Ver Youngerberger versus Romero, a case that involved uh, a requirement that institutionalized uh, people have adequate services, um, and, and I analogize that uh, as of a couple of other commentators to a right uh, to learn. Uh, looking at uh, Graham and the thin, virtually non-existent uh, penological justifications of punitiveness um, in uh, uh, truancy prosecutions. Um, what, I, what I argue is that uh, this right um, should uh, be recognized um, uh, on behalf of students who are being prosecuted, should be asserted and recognized, and that uh, before uh, a truancy prosecution is initiated, uh, there should be, and the remedy is very similar to the remedy that you just heard from uh, my two colleagues from the, from the Juvenile Law Center. The remedy that I elaborate is a remedy that uh, looks very much like sort of a wraparound special education um, remedy. Uh, and uh, that's not to say that, and I appreciate um, the, the, the sensitivity, the balance between overrepresentation and underrepresentation. On the one hand, you know, you don't want to pathologize kids who are not, you know, um, uh, uh, eligible or, or who don't need to be. On the other hand, as you note, it's one of the only ways to get uh, services these days for uh, kids. So my notion is forget the categorical eligibility requirements of, of IDEA um, uh, and 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, but this right should attach to every kid who is chronically and habitually true and who gets to the stage where uh, the state decides that because of that, uh, they are going to uh, prosecute. We've been doing this work in our, in our practicum. I call it ground truthing because 
The legal issues that we've encountered have been, have been really legion and have been tenacious and very, very difficult. We started out being appointed last year as um, guardian ad litem for education or education guardian ad litem for a select number of cases in our uh, juvenile court. Um, this year we're doing uh, the work as uh, defense counsel. Here are, some of the, here are some of the things that are going on in Tennessee. You can see the definition of truancy from the educational standpoint, from the education statutes and from the State Department of Education. Uh, you can see these, these numbers are astronomical. Needless to say, not every one of these uh, uh, truant students are, uh, are prosecuted, but um, a pretty good subset uh, of these students uh, in, you know, are prosecuted. And in our uh, county, um, there were hundreds and hundreds of cases coursing through the uh, truancy court, the juvenile court, um, uh, when we uh, first started doing this work. Uh, in Tennessee, uh, a juvenile, a youth is an uh, unruly status offense, right? Um, who, uh, for truancy, who is habitually and without justification truant from school. The without justification part we discovered was, first of all, never pleaded in the, uh, in the petitions. Uh, here is a, an example of a truancy uh, prosecution petition. It just simply say, it says that the child fails and refuses to attend school and has accumulated a certain number of, of absences. Um, never any mention, uh, of course, that, first of all, the state has the burden of proof to show, to prove this offense, and never any mention of the fact that, um, of justification. If you notice, the petitions in our county are taken uh, out by the school system. There are juvenile court liaison people who work with the social workers from the schools and who take out these uh, petitions. Here are some definitions from our state. They, uh, they give you some idea of what uh, excused absences uh, look like. Um, there are uh, obviously other uh, recognized um, excused absences. Whether all of these or any of these constitute justification in terms of cases that are tried, and no cases ever been tried as far as we could tell in our state, um, uh, there is no precedent for determining it. There are some states, there are a couple of states, Pennsylvania had a case from 2004 in which um, the without justification part of the statute was actually litigated. Of course, it was a kid with serious mental health problems, a kid with, um, uh, 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 I'm trying to, with, who was IDA eligible. It was a child welfare case uh, that was brought um, against a parent taking this kid away and uh, pretty resourceful lawyers, I think, raised these uh, claims. Um, here, you know, here are some more Tennessee-based stuff about absences and excused absences. I have to say, it is forbidding to try to figure out the attendance uh, and compul you know, under compulsory education, um, how they do this. I, we've talked to people at the State Department of Education, they say, you know, well, we have figures from five years ago. We're, you know, we're really hoping that we're going to get No Child Left Behind Act figures really soon. And, you know, oops, there was a flood in Nashville. And, um, you know, our, our data got lost. And um, uh, aside from that, it's really complicated, it, it seems to us, to figure out, first of all, the whole notion of what constitutes uh, uh, truancy. These are some of the uh, causes that uh, I mentioned before. Um, I'm not going to go through this case study. Um, this is a case study that one of our students uh, put together on one of our clients. Um, uh, essentially, um, our client was um, told, first of all, the parent to appear. This is the first, this is a letter that she allegedly got, but um, uh, often doesn't. Again, this letter comes from the juvenile court uh, liaison who's part of the school system. Um, we did this fact investigation. We found out that our client had been um, the victim of, uh, of rape. Uh, she had mononucleosis during this time that she was alleged to be uh, habitually truant. The school knew about it. Um, there was domestic violence also. The school knew about the order of protection that the, that the mom got. Um, the mom 
pressed statutory rape charges against the uh, adult who had raped uh, her daughter. Uh, the investigators for that came to the school. The school knew it. Um, and still, uh, this uh, truancy uh, petition was uh, brought. Throughout the process, the student lost weight, became sickly, avoided her peers, um, and had frequent, I think sporadic may be uh, an understatement uh, during this time, absences. Here's the, the mono came on top of this, uh, this situation, right? I'm not going to go through this. Uh, finally, we were able to get this uh, case uh, dismissed after uh, talking to the uh, district attorney and bringing these facts forward, which were never before uh, the district attorney or bef before the court where, where this client had, had pleaded guilty. Um, and uh, the case was dismissed with this crazy yellowed uh, re retention of jurisdiction, which we got rid of after we showed the judge that it's not um, uh, appropriate or legal under Tennessee law to retain jurisdiction in a status offense uh, truancy case. I wanted to show you this because this is the probation order um, that is typically used in our community uh, for kids who plead guilty, and everybody pleads guilty, right? Uh, uh, I mean, I, as I said, nobody has tried uh, a truancy case, and the issues of waiver and, and, and right to counsel and all that are, are really Im important. And I, I mentioned Bellevue, and I'll mention it again. But if you look at this truancy uh, petition, the way it works in our county is uh, the person I mentioned before, um, the juvenile court school system employed liaison, is the person who ultimately files the petition, swears to it. Um, then the student is brought into some type of pre-juvenile court screening with, with whom? With that person who reads the, uh, the juvenile, his or her, quote, rights. Um, then when it comes to court, uh, that person and her staff are sort of, nothing's ever prosecuted, so there's just a lot of information. Yes, this student has been out of school for 26 days. Look at the uh, attendance report. Um, once the student pleads guilty, then guess who becomes the probation uh, officer. The juvenile court liaison becomes the probation officer and is the one who is responsible for ensuring that the conditions of probation uh, are followed. Well, what's the first condition of probation? Attend school daily with no unexcused absences, right? These are children who have been absent from school for a million days, right? And all of a sudden, they're under an order which subjects them to a violation of probation, right, that says, go to school, right? And of course, the school system has already determined by filing the petition that any efforts that they've made are futile, right? So, so the probation officer, who is the school person who files the petition, is now responsible for fulfilling the functions of the probation officer, who is supposed to treat and rehabilitate and work with the student to help that student come back to school. It's a system we're challenging now. Uh, our case is on appeal. We've had several clients we've represented who pleaded guilty, and we have filed petitions to vacate their um, convictions, which the judge who took their plea denied, sympathetically, actually. Um, and uh, one of our claims is that this uh, system uh, violates our clients' due process rights and violates various provisions of the state uh, juvenile uh, law and, um, and code. Needless to say, you could see some of these other uh, conditions that for a lot of these kids are, are just completely um, unrealistic. Um, valid court orders. They're sort of the industrial strength uh, probation uh, or orders, right, which fortunately seem to be on their way out, but several of our clients we're subject to valid court orders, which is the exception in the Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention Act for being able to incarcerate status uh, offenders. And several of our clients serve not long, right? Seven, five days for, for truancy uh, in the juvenile detention uh, facility. Um, I'm not going to go through this um, uh, for you. Um, some of the issues that we have confronted in our practice, and I, I like to think of our legal work here as kind of a wraparound law practice um, because we have spent, as Barbara can attest, just, um, uh, just lots of time uh, trying to get our clients um, 
uh, educationally uh, settled in some way and serve. Um, IDEA, for example, has a provision that requires school systems to identify children who are suspected of having uh, educational disabilities under child find. Well, one of the things we first encountered was the school system said to us, well, we, we believe in child find, but you know, we can't evaluate your clients because guess what? What's, they don't go to school, right? So if they don't come to school, we can't evaluate them. We said, no, 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 no. That's not, you know, what your obligation is under child fine. You've got to actually go to where these kids are. Um, if they're staying home, go to the home and do the evaluation. Go to a community center that might be uh, near their home. Um, don't just, you know, ignore them or ignore your obligation because these children are, are not going to uh, school. I'm going to only go through uh, a couple of these. Um, access to experts has been a really big challenge. Access to psychologists who can do um, uh, evaluations, especially trauma-sensitive uh, evaluations for some of our uh, clients. Um, uh, issues around privacy are a big part of this uh, system. Um, uh, IDEA, FERPA, and HIPAA all have um, uh, obviously protections for the disclosure of uh, information and um, at least in uh, the course of our legal work um, we have had to really confront uh, issues about evaluations that disclose uh, information about the family that have nothing to do uh, with the child's educational eligibility um, but uh, come out uh, and uh, come to the IEP team and um, and as, as somebody mentioned before, also I think Lisa uh, gets spread, you know, informally through the various sort of systems that are supposed to be uh, there to protect uh, kids. Um, issues about interim services, you know, what we have done uh, with a number of our clients or several of our clients who have been out of school for a long time is uh, to say there's every indicia using screening, you know, rhetoric or principles the way you have, there's every indicia that our client should be evaluated. And as soon as you agree with us that our client should be evaluated, um, he or she is suspected of uh, having a disability or an impairment under 504, we want immediate sort of interim services during the course of the time of the 40 day, if not longer, sort of evaluation. And I mean real interim services to the extent that we can you know, we can, uh, we can develop them with the assistance uh, of an expert. Um, you know, disability sensitive probation orders. Oh, I, I, scared straight type programs. In the truancy program that we've been dealing with, um, there are several programs that the judge believes are, um, are uh, beneficial to kids um, that are kind of like these scared straight programs that very recently the U.S. Department of Justice said were completely ineffective in uh, altering uh, juveniles' behavior. I mean, one, the, pro the most prominent program in our community was called Moral Combat, right? And the Moral Combat program was, kids were ordered into this program, they were ordered to pay so that they, you know, sort of could become straight and, uh, and go to school. Um, lots of Medicaid issues, issues around transportation, um, uh, uh, these are just some of the, uh, some of the landscape that uh, we're facing uh, in, this, uh, in this practice. Um, there are obviously uh, others. Somebody said before that I think the best practice um, to the effect, and we believe this, the best practice should be at the lowest level. Um, and uh, we think that uh, this type of heightened practice um, at the lowest level, uh, the truancy court um, is appropriate. And, you know, my article is more sort of a, a theoretical plea to recognize that there has to be a whole lot more uh, efforts and intervention and thought that uh, goes into um, the educational issues of kids. That's not to say there aren't child welfare issues, that's not to say there aren't, um, uh, you know, poverty issues and what have you. Before a kid is prosecuted and um, suffers the consequences of that prosecution, which I, I guess I should end with, if 
forgot. The beginning of my paper talks about some of those consequences, um, and I guess it's a good way to, uh, to end. Um, uh, I've mentioned some of them, right? There's incarceration. Uh, there are fines. Um, there are uh, involuntary orders uh, for community service. Um, there are moral combat. Uh, there is recursive court involvement, right? Reviews and reviews and reviews. Now, some of, uh, we, we know that some of this is kind of well-meaning. Uh, you know, the juvenile judge is concerned about these uh, families and the like, um, but, um, but this recursive court involvement is quite uh, scary uh, to a lot of these children and family. Loss of driving pri privileges, imposition of curfews. This is not all uh, in Tennessee, it's around the country. Specification of unrealistic probation conditions, unwarranted disclosure of personal information, investigations of, of family neglect uh, when there is no uh, family uh, neglect except for the fact that the child is not uh, going to school. Um, there is monitoring in some parts of the, the country through uh, radio frequency identification technology, right? There, putting ankle bracelets on kids who don't go to school so that they can track down in some communities uh, where they are. There are some schools that actually punish kids educationally for uh, truancy, right? Grade reductions and, and the like. Uh, I think this is an area that is really ripe for uh, reform. And um, you know, my closing note is uh, the juvenile judge said to us, um, you know, I don't think um, the school system is filing enough truancy cases now. Uh, there are only 59, nobody quite knows, there are only 59 cases now. It used to be hundreds and hundreds. And we said, well, that's good. We, we think the school system is doing a, a better job at the front end, recognizing that they are the main resource to do this. And he said to us, they're scared shitless of you uh, <laughs> suing them. Um, and you know, we said, it's not why we're doing this, right? Uh, so uh, I appreciate the opportunity to tell you what, what's going on in our community. Thanks. Right, we are running a little bit behind schedule, but I think that if there are questions, right. we can take a few minutes to, to answer those. So if anyone would like to ask any of our authors, I think that have gone this morning a question, feel free. I can, I'll start with one, and I think anyone who wants to answer this can. Um, <clears throat> if, uh, there's been a lot of proposals that we've heard this morning, and I'm curious as to what sort of traction you all have had with your ideas that you put forward. Do you see committees and legislatures adopting the, these sort of tactics to deal with these, um, or are they largely ignored? That's or really a good question. Go? We have uh, spoken to uh, legislative uh, committee people in Tennessee. We've spoken to actually one of the key lawyers for a number of school systems. Um, uh, in our state, everybody agrees that the truancy prevention, the whole system's a mess. It just is antiquated. The dead hand of the past is controlling. Um, uh, but then we're told that in uh, the last couple of years in our legislature, um, much more punitive-oriented legislature legislators have been uh, elected who see kids who don't go to school as sort of bad kids and, you know, deserving of this kind of uh, uh, punitive approach. So Jane has been working on reform of the discipline system in North Carolina. Um, you know, our hope is that we can come up with some uh, approach uh, someday within my lifetime to, um, you know, certainly within my students law student's lifetime, I hope, to, uh, to make this system better. Not, not just in Tennessee, it really does need to, uh, 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 you know, it, it is really applicable in many, many states. California, for example, just enacted a very harsh truancy um, uh, provision. A lot of it directed at parents, right? Putting parents in jail for not having their kids to go to school, that, that makes a lot of sense, right? Um, uh, so, so, you know, um, uh, it needs to be done, uh, no question. How about you folks? Well, we um, have had some responsiveness, not at the legislative level, but at the administrative level, that we um, have had partners in our Department of Public Welfare who think that education 
of um, youth in the um, both child welfare and juvenile justice system are uh, is important. I think our our sort of broader goal for um, addressing change through education, uh, you know, through the ESEA and federal law is. Um, who knows if, you know, it's been sort of up for reauthorization. Nobody knows when it's actually going to happen. And um, I think our requests there are, are somewhat limited. You know, we're, we're at this point, we just want better data to be gathered so that that law can be uh, more effective and more effectively implemented. But um, I really think it's, I don't know, I have no, no idea which way that will go. And I would just add that to the extent that we have had success in implementing reforms, um, a lot of that has been because of trying to get reforms passed at a certain level and not necessarily having luck and then therefore being like, okay, we've learned from that. We're going to try now at the administrative level or at, with a different administrative body um, and get at it at a different level, contact a different stakeholder, get them to be our ally. Um, so, you, you know, it's not necessarily one solution fits all. And we do have actually um, uh, proposed rules from our juvenile court rules committee that would have judges ask questions about education at every hearing in the juvenile justice system. Um, they're proposed, they're, uh, we just have to wait and see if they've come, but they at least went through the rules committee, so we're hopeful about that as well. But the, the limited exposure I've had to juvenile justice, I've, um, I've been somewhat exposed to Missouri model, and I noticed that hadn't come up this morning, and I was wondering if this is something that people in the juvenile justice community see as kind of a beacon of hope, or if it's kind of overblown, and then also whether anybody, or what kind of efforts um, different states might be making to implement that. Well, I am not an expert in it. We, I definitely think that the, it looks like a much better model than People we have. People may not know what the Missouri model is, though. Um, Actually, wanna, someone with more knowledge than that. Um, <laughs> that Lisa, well, the, yeah. um, the, it, Missouri became quite famous for, for um, implementing a lot of counseling-based and treatment-based uh, initiatives, smaller cottages, and a lot of institutional approaches, and then trying to do the right thing. Social workers in our system <laughs> act more like cops yeah. um, than they do sort of therapeutic uh, agents and they're sort of forced into that, um, that model. And, uh, uh, you know, we're talking to some of the uh, faculty of the School of Social Work at our university and saying, and they agree, they say, is that really happening? You know, and we're, we're saying it is. And 
uh, there needs to be a whole lot of attitudinal re and, and re-education. Does anyone else have any questions they'd like to address before we go get some lunch? Well, we're going to be, for lunch, we're going to be in the same room we were for breakfast. For those of you who weren't at breakfast, you can just follow us. It's in the Bourbon Lounge. Um, and we'll start that right now. <laughs>